Oh. Yep. Okay. Let's get started then. <laughs> um, hi, everyone. I'm Tom Cole, and I'm uh, with Cornerstone General Contractors. I'm been their uh, chief estimator for 10 years and pre-construction services uh, executive slash business development executive. Um, but I recently retired from active duty. I'm still working uh, with the company to help develop the uh, diversity, equity and inclusiveness uh, aspect of our firm since we do business with uh, a number of, um, of organizations um, that uh, actively uh, pursue that type of um, procurement process. So uh, anyway, uh, today we're gonna to talk about, um, Willie, Willie's asked me to talk about the estimating and bidding process. So we're gonna go through that at a very high level because as, as most of you probably know, um, the estimating part of this business is a very detailed part and a lot of moving a very detailed process with a lot of moving parts and things like that. So as we go along, um, I, uh, I have prepared a number of exhibits that we're gonna look at, uh, and I'm gonna hit that those at a high level, but I've also given um, Tanya and Lily a uh, set of PDF files that you can request uh, that from them that have copies of all these exhibits to uh, so you have as a reference for um, working on your organizational structure. So I want to start out by saying that um, the estimating process is a very highly involved, detailed type of discipline um, that, uh, for obvious reasons, needs to have a lot of continuity, re uh, repetitive um, type of continuity and uh, ty uh, type of formatting, so you're not moving all over the place that you're using the same information templates and organizational structure from project to project to make sure that you um, um, maximize your efficiency in putting together cost estimates from one project to another. Um, I always like to kind of uh, start out with um, the Dilbert program. I like those Dilbert cartoons and uh, this one is where Dilbert and his partner and his boss are talking about, his boss is asking him for a budget uh, and he wants to know what it is right away. And um, one of the things that you'll find out, the point here is, is that there's never enough time to work on an estimate. Um, even when you're working in the pre-construction mode, uh, you always are up against some type of a deadline and it's a very dynamic process and things are changing on a daily basis sometimes. But when you're in a bid mode, it's even more of a time crunch because you only have maybe three weeks at the most, typically only two weeks to get up to speed on what you uh, want to submit a bid on and put your estimate together and bid it. So it's a um, highly dynamic process. So uh, the point is, is that having a standardized format and a systematic approach, uh, estimate over estimate, uh, project over project, is absolutely imperative. Well, like I said, um, preparing an estimate that has a lot of moving parts to it. So you want to be very precise in your assembly and uh, uniform in your approach from project bid to project bid. Um, uh, before we start talking about the actual templates and that process, there you should um, understand very clearly, uh, as well as whoever your business partners are and, and um, employees in the company, how is your form organized? Do you do, you do all the business um, from an internal staff, staffing structure, including estimating a course and putting out the bids? Or are you relying upon outside consultants uh, to do that type of work for you and provide you with the information that you take from there and then put your final bid together. Uh, what, type of, what type of estimating do you do? Do you do um, detailed unit uh, quantity takeoff type estimates or do you um, work more in a systems format and unit price type structure? It's, a, it's very important to understand that uh, type of process and the distinction of 
the level of detail that's associated with those types of um, estimates. Um, what, what does your firm do in terms of self-performance uh, type work? Um, what I mean by that, a perfect example is using Cornerstone as an example. We're a, a classic commercial general contractor, meaning that uh, that distinguishes us from a CM construction management type firm that historically the definition of a, histor of, of a construction management firm does not self-perform any work. They subcontract out everything. We're a classic general contractor, meaning that we self-perform all of our concrete work. Uh, sometimes a lot of our uh, select demolition work, sometimes uh, all of our rough framing carpentry work, if, there, if we're working on a project that's wood framed, we'll do all that. And sometimes um, during the process of uh, the commercial buildings that we build, there's associated steel construction that's embedded within the wood framing uh, and we'll do that erection. But typically that is what a self-performing general contractor definition encompasses um, versus a, a classic CM type of uh, program. Uh, so it's important that you understand that because uh, the labor component of a project is the most risky component uh, that basically doesn't have a fixed cost like a subcontractor supplier cost. Once you write the subcontract, that's fixed and shouldn't vary um, unless there's circumstances that uh, occur on the project that cause that to vary. But labor is not fixed that way. So you need to understand very clearly um, how you're going to approach that type of work and, and what productivity costs are historical costs so you can arrive at uh, the right labor estimate uh, for, the, for the firm if you're a self-performer. <clears throat> uh, what types of work does your firm pursue? Uh, sitting in on uh, the uh, earlier, the, the last part of the earlier presentation, I heard uh, the, the uh, phrases private work versus public work uh, used a little bit. So do you pursue strictly public work type process, which are classic bids? Or are you also pursuing work in the private sector where you may have an opportunity to negotiate the work versus putting in a fixed hard money lump sum bid as is the case in the public sector? Uh, does the firm, again, this kind of tags onto that, the sub question, does the firm bid or negotiate work? Typically almost uh, universally, all the work in the public sector is hard money bid. There are some uh, exceptions always to all the rules. And, um, but as a general case, most public work uh, or lump sum bids. So again, I go back to my comments about if you're doing self-performed labor, it's very important that you understand uh, how to estimate that based on what your historic productivities are. So you don't uh, get, get yourself into a situation where you overrun the labor and thus erode your margins or your fee on the job. If you're negotiating work, which is typically associated to the private sector, that becomes a little bit different type of approach. Um, you're typically working with the general contractor or an owner rep uh, that um, allows you to um, be able to set a guaranteed type of maximum price. We'll talk about the contract, different types of uh, contracts here in a minute, or I have a slide for that in uh, down the line here. And um, that is a, a little bit of a degree of separation from classic hard money low bids. You don't necessarily have to have a low bid uh, in private sector work and still be able to negotiate yourself a contract. Uh, who is your, this is a very important question. Who is your client base? From an organizational structure and your company mission statement, what, aside from the business the core business that you want to pursue, being a concrete contractor or a framing contractor or steel erector or drywall contractor, that is what I mean by that definition. Who do you want to pursue as your client base? If you're in the public sector, um, you, have an op you have several opportunities that are uh, available to you. And most of you guys probably already know that. Uh, general contractor uh, such as Cornerstone and the likes of uh, our 
uh, colleagues out there in the business are a prime target for pursuing work with and developing a relationship. But in the public sector, uh, a lot of owner agencies like the city of Seattle, um, Seattle Public Utilities, the Port of Seattle, uh, just to name a couple, they also have direct contracting opportunities that subcontractors can take advantage of without having to go through a general contractor. So it's important that you uh, understand uh, those opportunities out there so you can canvas the market in a more effective fashion to find the best suited opportunities for you. Um, a classic example of that is we here in Cornerstone, oftentimes uh, we don't bid a lot of work, but we do bid several projects a year, but uh, we will look if there's um, a coincidental occurrence and timing, so to speak, of two or three projects that we've been tracking for a year or two or, or longer that we're interested in, but they all come out at the same time. Then we sit down and have a very serious discussion uh, and review of the project and the available personnel that, uh, of each project and the available personnel that we have to put on those and determine whether or not we're gonna try to pursue all of them or we're gonna cast aside two of them and put all of our eggs, so to speak, in one basket, as the old expression goes, and goes after that one. So that's a very important aspect that you need to understand and constantly think about regarding the project opportunities that come your way and as well as the project, what you're looking for that's out there in the market and how they match up to your staffing uh, capabilities uh, to execute the work ever bit as much as being able to have the time to put together an estimate. Um, then uh, does your firm, which a lot of these firms on uh, the seminar today, they do have a classification um, and that's where the public agencies uh, provide opportunities, direct opportunities for disadvantaged business enterprises or uh, Wimby owned uh, type businesses and the like of that. So. That's a, we'll look at some of those agencies here in a minute. I have a slide that probably will look very familiar to a lot of you that are out there pursuing work. And one other um, aspect that I put on there in terms of if you, that's related to the estimating side of the, uh, the business is if you are in need of uh, help with an estimator, uh, there's, a, there's a professional industry, nationwide industry, organization out there known as ASPE, which is the acronym for American Society of Professional Estimators. And I've been a part of that organization for the last 20 years. Uh, the there's a chapter here in Seattle. If you need any further information on that, feel free to contact with me, or you can go to the regional website. Uh, I know there's a few folks here from Oregon. There's also a chapter down in Portland that can help you uh, with that. And, and even if it um, doesn't come to fruition that you find somebody, it's an excellent networking opportunity to get your company in front of uh, that, that organization in, the, in your local region uh, for, you know, for further business opportunities down the road. Okay, I talked a little bit about, um, uh, this is the slide where we're going to talk about the different types of contracts. And you heard me mention uh, public sector versus private sector type of contracts, lump sum uh, bids versus negotiating the work. So just to kind of do a very high level review of these types of, uh, of uh, delivery systems or methods, as you may want to call them, uh, the lump sum competitive bid, it's not got a total lock on the public sector, but because of the nature of the public sector accountability, that 95% of the work or maybe 98% of the work is has to be lumped, lump sum competitive bid. That, that we refer to that in our, um, in our world here as a rip and read bid. So you put together your bid and you submit it to the general contractor or you submit it to the agency or owner, uh, whoever you're uh, required to submit the bid to, they open it up and read your bid and it's cut and dried. If your bid is low, uh, you're gonna be in uh, the lead position for, um, for continuing on to um, negotiate a contract for that 
particular project. Uh, sometimes that is uh, also the case in private sector. Some owners choose to go that, me that method because of uh, some of the funding mechanism they, they have that are backstopping the, the projects, um, um, uh, REITs and things like that that require hard money bids. Uh, but generally in the private sector, um, we work with a, a method called guaranteed maximum price. And that is um, a more of a negotiating process uh, from the general contractor standpoint. And oftentimes a lot of the subcontractors, uh, we work on developing an estimate for the project that allows us to carry <clears throat> contingencies. And remember that word, we'll talk about that in a little bit, I've got a slide dedicated to that. And um, develop a price that what we believe at the time, based on the state of the documents, contract documents, the plans and specifications, what to be the true value of the project. And the whole process of uh, guaranteed maximum price is to go out and build the project uh, for the guaranteed maximum price or less and return a savings uh, to the owner. And uh, that oftentimes is participated at the subcontractor level for major contracts. Uh, so they get the opportunity to uh, participate in that process uh, on a case by case basis, depending on who the client is and, and how they're funded and how they're allowed to operate, uh, set up their contracts. Um, some other contracts that are commonly used in the business, and I know the next one, time and materials, that's um, not to exceed. That's a, that's a contract that um, is typically used in the private sector, uh, residential side, uh, house bu home building a lot, uh, not so much apartment building, but the home building, single family home building is done that way where the general contractor develops a project for the budget, for the project and um, the um, work is then done on a time and material basis. And that's requ that requires a lot of paperwork and documentation. Uh, you won't see that going on in uh, the public sector uh, very often, uh, and nor will you see it going on in the major capital uh, market sectors of the private side of the, of the business. Although, although some companies do, uh, utilize that type of um, delivery system. Boeing being a good example. I've done several projects uh, in, throughout the course of my career uh, on a time and material not to exceed basis uh, for Boeing. Um, <clears throat> cost plus percent um, of overhead and fixed fee. Again, that's another variation of time and material, but your uh, fee is fixed and your overhead is fixed. Um, in the public sector, the best way to represent that is uh, in the uh, GCCM delivery, as it's called in the state of Washington, down in Oregon, it's just reversed, it's CMGC, but it's the same process. Um, it stands for General Contractor Construction Manager, and where the contractor is brought on to um, work as a construction management consultant in pre-construction phase during design and provide estimating and scheduling services and bid packaging services and then bid out the job. Um, and whether they choose to self-perform or as I said earlier, CM the job, uh, there's criteria that they have to follow to do that. But their fee for the project that is fixed and their general conditions, we'll talk a little bit about what general conditions are from uh, a general contractor's perspective uh, in a little bit, but those, those two cost components are fixed. Um, then there's a cost plus fixed overhead and fee. Um, the last one there is what I basically just talked about. Uh, the private sector, as I said, uh, will utilize this method. Boeing is a good example of that. Um, some of the hospital, uh, institutional hospitals up in Capitol Hill and down in Oregon um, uh, operate this operate on this type of a delivery as well. Okay, uh, so before you can bid something, you got to find a project, and we talked a little bit about that: knowing your market, uh, identifying your partner client base, 
and developing relationships. Um, it's important to understand that uh, in our sector, uh, in our construction business industry sector, however you want to characterize that, that certain owners do certain things. U.S. military obviously does U.S. military work, NAVFAC, um, GSA does uh, their federal type of work. And then in the private, private sector or non-military, non-governmental sector, you have school districts obviously out there building school projects all over the Puget Sound and, and everywhere else for that matter. And um, hospital agencies building medical facilities. Uh, these are all typical examples of public sector work. Uh, it's it's uh, the same for the private sector work. There's in, an infinite number of developers out there. You can pick the Daily Journal of Commerce up every single day and you will see on the front page, a developer is buying property to develop a project somewhere. Today's DJC had a feature article about the uh, student housing project that's being built up in the university district uh, adjacent to the University of Washington campus. And there's a little bit of um, history on that that's in that article. But my point is this, is that along with the diff various different agencies, so to speak, that are out there uh, acting as developers, and yes, the city of Seattle and the port of Seattle and um, um, the associated public school districts, they're all agencies. That's how to characterize that. So when you hear the term agency, think owner. And uh, they are all associated with um, a certain sector uh, of architects and engineers that align themselves with becoming proficient at doing those types of projects. So what I mean by that is, is uh, it's important for you to understand um, that certain architects specialize in doing schools. Certain architects will specialize in doing medical work. And lots of times, the, the larger they get and the more efficient they get at that, uh, the, the less likelihood they will be to take on a project that is not within their business sector because of lack of understanding um, of the design criteria and the usage of the facility for those types of facilities. So that's that translates into the same thing for you guys out there as a construction company looking for uh, business opportunities, bidding opportunities, if you will, in the case of this discussion, uh, to make sure that you become proficient in understanding of a block of work or a sector of work that you have clear understanding of and become uh, very efficient at executing that type of work as well as executing the bid, knowing what the market price sector uh, break point is or price point, as we say here in the office, okay? Um, the other aspects of, of I want you to identify a project is uh, look at, see if there's set aside opportunities associated with that project. I know the city of Seattle, city of Tacoma, the Port of Seattle, and um, all those types of agencies have uh, set aside type opportunities uh, for the different classifications. I say hub zone here, which is a historically underutilized business. City of Tacoma has a lot of opportunities pointed in, at that type of uh, market sector, but Wimby's and veteran owned businesses and disadvantaged businesses all have those types of opportunities for them out there. Okay. Um, that once you get zeroed in on a project or thinking is the other things that you have to start thinking about is re read the type of um, project that it is to make sure that it is in your um, wheelhouse, as we say, and then look at the instructions to bidders very thoroughly, read those, the invitation for bid, the uh, bidding requirements, um, then look at the specifications and drawings to make sure that it is something that you want to get involved with and which uh, plans and specifications are what we typically refer to as the contract documents. There's a few other ancillary um, documents that, that are incorporated into contract documents, but the primary two documents are plans and specifications. Um, also look at the scheduling and the phasing of the projects. Make sure that you understand what the schedule is 
for a project, uh, whether it's a private sector project or a public sector project. Um, oftentimes, there are multiple phases associated with uh, a project. Um, a good example of what we do here is building um, um, schools on occupied campuses where the district will have um, uh, an elementary school or a high school or whatever uh, already built and in operation and they want to rebuild that project on that site. So it will require a substantial amount of phasing and scheduling uh, over a longer period of time as, than if it was a, um, a greenfield site uh, where, where you just go out there and there's nothing there you develop the site from the beginning. So phasing um, is important and uh, scheduling is important from the standpoint of cost in the estimate that if it makes, if you're uh, going uh, over multiple different years and you're tied to some union collective bargaining contracts like carpenters or cement finishers or teamsters, whatever you're tied into, uh, those wages typically go up on an annual basis. So you need to be able to predict or forecast uh, what those uh, elements of cost escalation will be um, over that period of time and make sure you recover or capture that cost in your estimate if you go if the project in the different phases of the project go over um, you know the go go over those different periods of time. Um, then the bonding requirements. Uh, this will go back. I won't talk too much about this. Goes back to what you probably talked a lot about uh, preceding this presentation with Don and, and Propel, but um, in the public, just speaking from the public sector perspective and doing mostly GCCM work, um, there is a, um, the RCW that governs and the execution of the GCCM process requires all subcontract bids over $300,000 to be 100% bonded. So that would typically uh, mean like the drywall contractor on, on projects that are 20 million, 15 million or more, that would typically mean that the drywall contractor, the mechanical contractor, electrical contractor, oftentimes the site contractor, steel erector, a lot of those contracts um, will be um, required to be bonded. So um, that's all I'll say about that. And on the, on the private sector side, um, that's a, that's an entirely elective type of process. Um, so you need to, again, going back to understanding who your client base is and who you wanna work with as business partners, uh, you need to have a clear understanding of uh, what they're going to require of you in terms of being able to, um, uh, allowing you to bid a project that may be outside your historic performance range. What I will say though, uh, and listening to the last part of the, the, the conversation with Don and Propel is that a number of us general contractors, there's many of them that will also help uh, your firms try to find a solution to uh, the bonding um, hurdles that you, have, that you face, um, as well as other things. Also, we, we want to help you with uh, your estimating process and your project management process. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that towards the end of this presentation. But a lot of the general contractors that engage in public sector delivery and their common uh, agencies that they work with, City of Seattle, uh, Seattle School District, the Port of Seattle, WashDOT, uh, SDOT, uh, you name it, they are in the business of trying to enable, and I wanna emphasize that word, enable you to become a successful business. And that means helping you with trying to find a solution uh, to the bonding requirements for your project. We want you to participate uh, on the projects and, and we want to help proactively um, help you with um, finding a solution to those um, challenges. Then the other uh, requirements, we'll just hit these at a very high level. When you're doing public sector work, <clears throat> um, your wages for labor are gonna be uh, subject to the Davis-Bacon Act and in the state and in whatever given state you're working from, the state sub, uh, what we call the little Davis-Bacon Acts, but the state uh, legislation that requires prevailing wages for the 
given geographic uh, location. That's uniformly the requirement across the United States. There are, uh, even in right to work states, there are still minimum um, wages that have to be paid. So it's important that you understand uh, what the world is that you live in with your craft trade labor, uh, whether you're, you're open shop or you're, um, you know, subject to a collective bargaining agreement, you have to understand how much those costs are. I'll, I just kind of summarize everything here. I think you guys have got the theme so far that estimate is all about cost recognition. So that's why I said at the beginning of this, there's a lot of moving parts. And I understand that this may be this presentation, given we only got a, an hour and a half or so, maybe like drinking from a fire hose, so to speak. But that's one of the reasons why I made up a pack of um, PDFs to help you at the end um, and for you to try to take notes and go through this. Um, I, would, I, I would suggest that you just listen to the discussion and then feel free to either contact Lily or Tanya or me directly with a direct question that may not be answered, uh, you know, within the time frame that we have today, and I'll be glad to try to help uh, provide, you know, further information in that regard. Okay, so this is what I referred to this a couple of minutes ago. The, this is uh, just a list of a lot of uh, the, of uh, op locations for looking at bid opportunities, and most of you that are in the business in the Puget Sound region and to a large degree in the Portland region, um, as well as other locations, even up in Alaska and the other outlying uh, Pacific Northwest areas. And, and if, even if you're in other parts of the country, um, these are the most common places that you can find bid opportunities. Um, as far as the best one in this, in this region, meaning the Puget Sound region, is Builders Exchange of Washington, uh, bxwa.com. That's the go-to um, website that anybody can go to and look up a, a project um, for either the agency or on the general contractor's uh, tab of that website. Um, then the others, of course, the other one that everybody sees on a daily basis that's out there is the Daily Journal of Commerce. Um, even if you don't have a subscription to it, you can just go to djc.com and you can still scroll through the bid opportunities. But um, there's, other, there's, there's others, of course. The other, the biggest state agency uh, website is uh, DES, uh, Department of Enterprise Services for the state of Washington. They manage uh, most of the, um, well, they manage all the community college work and they manage a lot of other different sub agencies of the state. Um, the, the only universities that they don't manage, I think, in the state of Washington are, is UOW and uh, Wazoo, Washington State. Uh, they have a franchise authority to uh, manage all their own work. But Department of Enterprise Services is a very good place to go to look for bid opportunities, not only construction, but also supply type opportunities and services type opportunities as well. As I said, it's the design, it's um, Department of Enterprise Services. So it goes way beyond construction uh, contract opportunities, okay? One of the gentlemen I heard uh, is um, uh, engaged in providing transportation services. Uh, that may be a good place for you to start looking uh, for uh, further opportunities. And obviously all the agencies have their own websites, the Port of Seattle, the City of Seattle, S dot, W dot, um, you name them, the, the alphabet soup of all the agencies and the school districts will publish all their uh, projects, opportunities in the, in the paper as well. And then the, the uh, probably the next best um, opportunity or place to find opportunities is the general contractors own websites. Uh, and you'll see here in a little bit, uh, example of some of ours that we have, but uh, you can find those on the general contractors websites directly, or you can find them on Builders Exchange, the general contractors page, and then they're listed alphabetically. And you go and click on the general contractor that you're wanting to do business with and 
or have talked with and see what their opportunities are after you click into their uh, website. Um, that's pretty much what I'll, I have to say about this one. But the last bullet point I have on this is networking with peer group associations. Uh, this is, in my mind, a very important opportunity not to be missed by anybody that's in this business or, or an allied business, including if you're a design firm or a consulting firm or engineering services of another nature. Become engaged and involved in your professional organizations that represent your profession and your scope of work and get to know who the other colleagues are in your business. And you will definitely get uh, some opportunities to find new bidding opportunities or project opportunities that you may not uh, have heard of otherwise because they're in the early stages of planning. Keep in mind what you see in the Daily Journal of Commerce and on Builders Exchange is what's happening in real time. To be a really effective business development person, you need to be looking at business opportunities and talking to the firms, general contractors, professional associations, agencies, what's coming up in the next year? What are you working on that hasn't hit the streets yet? That's very, very important component of the business, as well as uh, it also takes a certain amount of time and dedication to be able to, to work on that. Um, because it takes away from managing uh, the day-to-day -day activities of your firm. So if you have a very small firm, um, you need to figure out how to work that component, even if it's baby steps into uh, your business development program. Okay, this is a, uh, we talked about, uh, we're going to go start talking about um, um, the uh, bidding uh, process here in a minute, but I want to kind of close out this first part of the conversation with here's an example of what we did. We just recently completed um, the North Edition and the seismic upgrade to Ingram High School for the Seattle School District um, earlier this year. Um, it, it went on for the last two years. And this was a, 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 an example of uh, when we went out to um, the uh, for OMWBE solicitations on this project. This is a GCCM project. We worked on it for about 14 months in pre-construction services to develop the budget for the project, the scope, help the architect and the program and the school district achieve their program and the design intent and the, and the budget for the project. Um, and uh, then towards uh, the final um, 60 days, 90 days of the pre-construction process, we started going out for a phased uh, bid package bidding process. And this is just an example. Uh, I'll show you a couple more here in a, a minute, but uh, we will we use this, this, uh, this um, offer process all the time. Okay, um, as you heard, and as you've been listening, you, you, pretty, you pretty much know that there's a lot of moving parts on this thing. The point on this slide is, make sure that you are thinking ahead all the time. Um, the, this slide here, I, I just pulled from when I used to teach estimate at the University of Washington um, construction management program. Uh, I had this uh, slide in uh, my uh, presentations of the estimating class uh, that, I, um, that I say you have to adhere to. I didn't, I didn't create this, but I repeat this um, religiously on a daily basis to estimating teams, whether my staff here at the office or where, wherever I've been or where, wherever I may be given a presentation. You have to strictly adhere to the 5P principle uh, in planning and executing your estimate process, as well as in planning and executing the construction side once you get past the estimating process. Um, and then on bid day, we'll talk a little bit about bid day. We're not going to get into uh, it too deep, but I want you to understand some of the basic principles of working the estimate uh, in, a, in the bid day time frame. In other words, the eight hours that or the 10 hours that you're in the office on, a, on an actual day of bid from a general contractor's perspective, it could be 12 hours uh, that we're in the office on that day. 
and, and we're not getting anything, we're not doing anything that day, but uh, analyzing bids and putting the, finalizing the total bid price because all the preparatory work has been done in the preceding weeks leading up to that. So uh, you can understand that uh, bids basically, bid day process is something that goes on from the, the early morning to about two, three o'clock in the afternoon. Sometimes some school districts still kind of like to work on the evening bid opening because they have the board present and anybody on the school district uh, that wants to come in for the bid opening, they, they open it up for that. But most of the bids are either two or three o'clock in the afternoon. So we roughly have about eight hours to be able to put the, an estimate price together on, on bid day. So I have, uh, a credo by that, uh, by virtue of that, working within that time frame, it's the uh, don't delay decisions. And Cole's corollary is free it up, file it, refer it, estimate it, or execute the task. In other words, don't dilly dally around, make a decision and move on. Um, okay, so we're gonna move into the actual estimate um, organizational structure. And I wanted to start out by saying that an estimate is a very dynamic tool uh, and uh, not only to enable you to get work, but to enable you to execute work as well as it becomes ultimately, whether you get the work or not, a historical document for you to be able to refer back to. So it's important that if you uh, bid work and you uh, don't get that job, don't round file that estimate, put it into a file of uh, labeled appropriately so you can go back and refer to it um, as, as required for the next bid if you encounter a similar types of scope of work uh, so you can see what your decision process uh, evolved into on the previous bid and use that to uh, refine your decision process on the present bid. But once the estimate becomes a project, in other words, you become awarded the project, the estimate gets converted into a job cost report. And it doesn't make any difference whether you're a general contractor or a subcontractor. Uh, maybe it's a little bit different if you're strictly a supplier, it's a commodity-based type of decision, uh, but still you have a number of items that you have to tend to, whether you're a supplier or a subcontractor or a general contractor. And then the general contractor in the subcontractor's world, a job cost report basically represents three aspects, cost aspects or cost components, I should say, it's probably a better term, of, of each project. And every project is uniformly the same always. Uh, and that's labor costs, uh, material costs, and subcontractor supplier costs. Um, those are the three major components of costs that are direct work for uh, going into the project. In other words, they're exclusive of general conditions, fee and markup type costs. And we're gonna talk about those in a little bit, but those are the three major components that are quote unquote incorporated into the construction of the project. And then you have, as a result of that, uh, on, the, on the staffing side of uh, supporting the job cost um, process is you have the accounting department, uh, whether you're a one person show or you have an evolved accounting department that manages labor and material and subcontractor costs separately. Uh, you have to be able to make payments in a timely uh, fashion to all your accreditors and accounts, as well as receive uh, your uh, payment request from your business partner that you're uh, contracted with. Okay, after the project, um, as the project evolves and aspects of the project um, sunset, in other words, close themselves out and you finish the project, you have what they call um, basically a historical database. Um, and that is what I'm telling you is important for your next project to be able to uh, compare what you did there versus what you're looking at in the new project to, and how you did from a 
uh, cost efficiency performance standpoint, you want to make sure that you understand what the risks are associated with the current project that you're looking at and how they align themselves or did not align them, did not align themselves with your past work so you can appropriately uh, price out the new work. And that becomes basically the starting point for your future bidding process, okay? And it's important to keep the labor costs in their own records vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis a labor report. Uh, you should have one, something like that produced on a weekly basis. Um, I've been in an environment um, in my past um, career where we had labor reports at the end of the day. Once we got things set up in the computer, right? We had um, a, a labor foreman or a foreman designated on the job site that would actually come in an hour early and sit down in front of a computer and input all the costs for that day. So when the superintendent and the project manager came back to work the next morning or uh, they wanted to look at it after eight o'clock that night, they could see what their performance was on the daily basis for whatever given work that they were working on during that day and be able to make some kind of a rational decision to make an adjustment if, if it required based on the trend of where the labor costs uh, were headed on, on any given element of work. Um, so that's a little bit about how the estimate evolves into a dynamic living document. The, uh, the estimating process, you, talk, you heard me talk a little bit about it in a superficial way, but this, is a, this graphic basically shows uh, the process of how you work from the beginning to the end. Uh, the beginning being at the bottom of the triangle and the end bid day being at the top of the triangle, or if it's a negotiated process, the day that you turn over your guaranteed maximum price. And I, I won't go through each one of these. We've already been talking about it, but you can, it's self-explanatory. You can see how that process needs to uh, flow um, to be able to put together uh, an estimate that's uh, reflective of the project that, uh, aspect of the project that you're bidding. Okay, the process, the estimating overview uh, in bullet points versus that graphic is um, preliminary bidding and estimating considerations. We've talked a little bit about that. That's the, what I characterize as the go, no go process. And if it's a go process, uh, you go out to the pre-bid meeting, you look at the contract documents, uh, you, you uh, study those. Uh, you look at the existing conditions if you're in the business that you have to um, recognize and understand clearly what the existing site conditions are, such as a site work contractor, uh, things like that. Drywall contractor may not be worried about existing conditions so much as they are what uh, the scope of the drywall work is that's uh, detailed out on the plans and specifications. Uh, but those are some examples of what I'm talking about there in the, in the bidding conditions. Also, you heard me talk a little bit about scheduling and phasing, make sure you clearly understand that, that process, okay? Uh, then estimating the labor and equipment costs. This um, can be characterized as uh, the quantity takeoff phase, which is um, on that graphic, preceding graphic of the triangle that goes up. Uh, we're not gonna talk about quantity takeoff or stripping off the quantities uh, in, this present in this presentation. That's a completely different um, process of the uh, component of the estimating process, but just suffice it to know that this is the most time consuming part of, um, the, of the estimate process that has to be done in a very detailed and a consistently the same process, uh, estimate over estimate year over year. Uh, so you understand how to, uh, you know, work your way in a systematic fashion through the scope of work set it up and be able to understand it from one project to another, as well as if you're working in a group environment or a corporate environment, such as I have been for the last 40 years, um, that your bosses or another estimator can grab your estimate and easily interpret uh, the story that you wrote out and the quantity takeoff and the pricing and things like that. Then during that time, uh, you also work a parallel path with your subcontractors 
and suppliers. <clears throat> and even if you're a subcontractor, you have a number of suppliers. So the process is exactly the same. It's just on a slightly smaller scale. You're working on a component of work versus on the whole project. Suppliers are a little bit more commodity driven. They look at what they're going to provide a, a bid on and then say, let's just say there's a uh, 500 doors on a project and you're talking to a door supplier, it's a pretty, it's a pretty cut and dried process with the door supplier. But um, the, the process, the, the most important uh, aspect of this process is that you actually get out there on the street, so to speak, and start talking to your business partners about what they see in the scope of the work. Let's use drywall as an example. Uh, maybe the engineer and the architect have um, called out something weird uh, or not uncut that's not customary in terms of the structural steel framing or the light gauge framing, I mean, for the drywall, and you want to make a note of that and make some kind of a conduct some kind of a collaborative process with your subcontractor. Or should we bring this, should we bring this up to the architect in the pre-bid phase? Because uh, it may be, it, it may be um, not a typo, but a spec that was copied over from a previous project that that um, criteria is no longer valid for this, this project, those types of things. So understanding your project from the lowest level uh, to the highest level is what I mean by that process. Then at the same time, um, somebody, uh, hopefully, if uh, you're a one uh, person shop, two person shop, my empathy goes out to you, you still have to do this too. But in a corporate environment, we'll have uh, the project executive or the project uh, manager and the superintendent working on the general conditions costs for a project. Uh, we're going to talk about that a little bit, but the, basically the general conditions costs of the project is, a, is an indirect cost and um, meaning that it's not incorporated. It's not a cost that's incorporated into the structure of the project, but it's a cost that is um, required to be able to manage the project for the schedule and the duration and the conditions that are stipulated in the specifications for the project and the complicity of the project. So if you're working on a small 25,000 square foot concrete tilt up warehouse, you may have a foreman and you may have um, a project engineer that works one quarter time because it doesn't require a lot of detail uh, versus if you're working on a project at the University of Washington or out at the Port of Seattle <clears throat> in the airport facility out there that's a uh, $100 million project and it's taken three years and you got to have a staff of 25 or 30 people out there managing that project because of all the moving parts. That's what I mean by uh, the general conditions. So uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. I, I'll show you, I have a template for you and I'll show you how that should be organized, uh, but we won't get down into the weeds on how to estimate those costs. Uh, and then finally, um, you recap uh, all the project costs, uh, which is uh, towards the top of that triangle in the previous graphic and you start summing everything up and getting it into a spreadsheet, whether you're handwriting a spreadsheet or using Excel or Access, um, or if you're using a database estimating system, um, <clears throat> you get all your direct costs and, um, uh, organized in the CSI format, um, construction specifications format, or whatever format the specifications are written to. So you have it that it mirrors um, the specifications in an organized fashion and you have your costs aligned in that, in that fashion. Um, that moves us into the estimate structure. Uh, so before I talk about this, uh, at the end of this slide, we'll have a poll question. Hello, Tanya or Lily. <laughs> we'll have a poll question coming up here. So the, basically the estimate structure is um, divided into two um, two distinct components of costs. Um, the first one, the direct costs, you heard me talk a little bit about that. And uh, the second one are indirect costs. You just heard me talk a little bit about that when I was uh, talking about the general conditions. So basically direct costs in a nutshell the definition of a direct cost 
are all costs that are associated with uh, the work that's incorporated into the construction of the project. Concrete, structural steel, drywall, paint, um, mechanical, electrical, the site work, those are all examples of direct costs. And uh, the subcomponents of direct costs, of course, are labor, materials, equipment, and subcontractors. So those costs that are incorporated into the building or the project costs, whether it's a building or a civil project or some, something else, infrastructure type project, that's, that's your element of direct costs. And that's where the largest risk of the project, you heard me talk about a little about this earlier, in particular with the labor component of the project, that's where the biggest risk lies. Okay, to tie it back to the earlier discussion about bonding is uh, the larger the subcontract agreements are and supply agreements are, um, <clears throat> the uh, risk uh, uh, exponentially increases, uh, especially with the duration of the project of, um, you know, uh, performance from project, from project partners on that. So that's why bonding is such a, a challenge for not, not only uh, small firms, but also large firms. They're subject to the same criteria that you are subject to. So uh, bonding companies are not to digress here, but they look at uh, the risk and what your ability is from an internal staffing standpoint to manage that work over the duration in conjunction with uh, how much work you already have going out there. And um, they want to enable you to be able to build your backlog in a systematic uh, way. So um, those are direct costs. Indirect costs are costs that are associated with managing the project, the general conditions, uh, as we just talked about. Uh, that would be the superintendent and the project manager and project executive and the job trailers and things like that. You know, the Santa cans, the temporary power, uh, temporary water and things like that associated with the project. And again, I, like I said, I have a template that has a bunch of those line items out there that'll sh give you a really good idea of, of the cost segregation and where they should be that you can ask Lily or uh, Tanya for. They'll email that PDF to you. <clears throat> then the other two components are uh, overhead and profit. Um, subcontractors work sometimes uh, from an overhead and profit, or when I say profit, I, the, the word fee also uh, is uh, consistent or inferred there. Um, a lot of subcontractors, instead of calculating a specific set of general conditions, they work on a more simplified basis of, of a aggregate component overhead uh, percentage, as well as a, a, fee per, a separate fee percentage. So what that means is, is that subcontractors have boiled down their project supervision costs and other associated individual component uh, general conditions costs and averaged them out over uh, a project over project, year over year basis, and determine that those costs fall within a certain percentage range of the total cost of the job, um, uh, the total cost of the, the direct work um, based on whatever duration of the project is. And that's okay. Um, that makes it easy uh, for you to be able to, to bid a project and know that if you put a 15 or 25% fee or whatever it happens to be, that those costs uh, are going to be covered uh, during the course of your work um, and the course of the project. Um, the next one or the next indirect cost is uh, the markups, basically the bonds, insurance, and taxes. In the state of Washington, I will address that from that standpoint, is uh, you heard me say uh, a, a little bit about bonds in the public sector on GCCM. Every, every cost element of a project that's over $300,000, whether it's a subcontract amount or whether it's a, a supply agreement amount, if it's over $300,000, the state of Washington requires 100% performance of payment bond be posted for that um, individual 
component of the job. Um, insurance, um, basically uh, everybody that operates in the state of Washington, and for the most part, I think every state in the union has to carry general liability insurance. And the state regulates that. And uh, those insurance limits are stipulated in the general conditions of the specifications book that all contractors, and I, and I uh, emphasize the word contractors and subcontractors, not necessarily suppliers, because they're not performing on-site uh, labor. They're just delivering material to a job. But subcontractors and contractors have to carry general liability insurance. That's a state law. And every state's that way. And it's based on a volume type of um, uh, proportionate uh, percentage basis. Okay, so depending on how much volume you do a year is going to kind of determine what your insurance company uh, charges you for the uh, fees and the premiums for your general liability insurance. And there's one other insurance component I'll talk about in a minute, but I want to cover the the taxes uh, first, and then we'll come back and visit the insurance thing. Um, in the state of Washington, I don't know about other states, but in the state of Washington, it's a law, the Department of Revenue has stipulated that there will be a business and occupation excise tax paid on the amount of business that you do uh, on, a, on an annual basis. And in the state of Washington, that's a fixed percentage. Uh, the state law has also uh, allowed uh, individual municipalities the ability to um, impose a, um, a business and occupation excise tax. The city of Seattle is a very good example of that. They have their own excise tax. So you have to know the zip code of where your project is uh, to be able to uh, determine sometimes uh, what the uh, total markup in the terms of excise taxes are going to be. In, re in regards to the state sales tax aspect, since uh, Washington State is a, is a state sales tax based type of uh, process, um, the State Department of Revenue has um, declared that contractors are wholesalers. So state sales tax is not included in the original bid because you're considered a wholesaler. So subcontractors should not include sales tax on a, on a regular basis unless there's something inside the specification of general conditions that say you have to include sales tax uh, on it because they're getting some kind of a special federal funding grant or uh, funding uh, you know, money subsidy in some fashion that the feds require sales tax to be paid on that, included on that in the, in the cost of the bid. So the way that's managed is since the contractors are um, considered wholesalers, what they do is the um, subcontractors exclude the state sales tax. And then when the, on a monthly basis, when the contractor, general contractor bills uh, his business partner or the owner, whoever that may be, they apply the appropriate amount of sales tax to be collected uh, for that proportionate payment. So if you're billing out a million dollars for a, a given month um, of all the billings that include your work, the subcontractors and suppliers uh, that was accomplished during that period of time, you add in the appropriate sales tax uh, for that um, million dollars based on uh, the, the zip code of that location, okay? Um, uh, there's, a, there's some exceptions to that rule, uh, but we're not gonna get into them. That's the general overview of how you manage taxes. Business and, ex, business and occupation excise taxes, I will again emphasize, they have to be incorporated into your bid, okay? So let's go back to uh, insurance. One last comment about insurance. General liability insurance is required to be included in your bid uh, by uh, the state regulations. And those percentages, uh, not percentages, but those limits are, are specified in the spec book and the general conditions and all contractors have to follow those, okay? 
There's no exceptions to the rule on that. Uh, that's a law. Uh, there's one other element of insurance that subcontractors typically don't have to concern themselves with, uh, but the general contractors definitely have to. And if you're a subcontractor that's going to work as a prime contractor, in other words, have a direct contract with the owner, you need to understand this. And that is uh, the there's a all risk type of insurance or what we characterize colloquially as builder's risk insurance component that has to be incorporated in the, into the cost of the project at bid time. Builder's risk is completely different than general liability insurance in that builder's risk is a policy that ensures the value of the construction during the construction process. So if you have a loss a fire or water damage or anything, something, something like that. Uh, that's a builder's risk loss and that loss will be covered under a builder's risk policy. Like I said, subcontractors that are working as a subcontractor or under general contractor typically do not need to uh, worry about that. Uh, but if you're a subcontractor like a mechanical or electrical or even a drywall contractor sometimes that uh, say the Port of Seattle is looking for some tenant improvement work and you're going to go out there and bid that and maybe carry a painting contractor with you and a carpet contractor, but you're going to be the general on the job. You need to look at that um, very closely in the specifications and understand what uh, that is. And that it's typically based on um, the value of the job. Um, and if the jobs are very small, sometimes it's an inverse type of uh, percentage, meaning that it's higher um, because the job's so small, the cost may be disproportionately higher than if you were working on a 50 or $100 million project. Okay, that's that's what builder's risk is or all risk insurance. So um, we'll call for a poll. And the first question would be, um, what type of cost is forming concrete footing? Is it an indirect cost or a direct cost? How do you um, how do you manage uh, the responses to the polling? We'll give them a few seconds and see. Let's see. We have about twenty people still on the line, so we'll wait and see how many people can respond, um, and then I'll end polling and post the results. So we've got about five people have responded. Getting there. A couple more people. Come on. And I apologize for the flickering poll earlier. My mouse got stuck on the button and wouldn't <laughs> stop. <laughs> Those, those darn mice. <laughs> it is so oh, frustrating. <laughs> Glad I was on mute at that time. That's all I can say. <laughs> all right, let's go ahead and we're going to end the poll in three, two, one. And our results. Everybody says direct costs. Excellent. Excellent. I'm a happy camper. <laughs> you guys are listening. <laughs> <laughs> very good, very good. Okay, um, did was that the only question that you asked, or did you put them all out there? I just put the one out at a time. So you want me to put the next one out? Um, okay, let's put let's put question two, three, and four out there, and then just hold it for a little bit, and then uh, when we get down towards the end and we start talking about contingencies. You can put five out there. Actually, if you want to put them all out there, when we get done with talking about contingencies, then we'll uh, look at the poll results then. I have to do them one at a time. So you keep talking and I'll post polls as we go. Okay. All right. <laughs> all right. So next slide. Next slide. Come on. Hello. There we go. Um, Okay, we talked a little bit about bid markups. Uh, this is just a list. I'm not going to go through this again. Um, but there was one element to this that we didn't talk about, and that's the first bullet point, um, <clears throat> and that's uh, labor burden. Um, just to kind of, uh, not no pun intended here, but to belabor this a little bit, um, labor, component, labor costs, as I said, are the most risky part of the estimate uh, because it's not a fixed cost. 
It's totally based on productivity and you have to have a very clear understanding of how efficient your team is on your crew and your superintendent and be able to manage uh, the direct labor component of the cost. So when it comes to labor, labor is basically uh, broken into two components, the living wage that the individual takes home and then uh, the, all the markups. Um, and when I, when I say the living wage that the individual takes home, that's the hourly rate that that person's paid that also includes the federal and state mandated uh, markups for FICA food and SUDA. If you're in a collective bargaining agreement, <clears throat> uh, meaning that you're a union company, there's a second component and that's the fringe benefits uh, that the union uh, collects based on what uh, the hourly, uh, based on every hour that the individual works, okay? That's what we call fringe benefits. So that's um, part of the labor component. And we call uh, the labor component and the FICA food and SUDA component uh, the, the fringe benefits or the labor burden. So the way some, has, some contractors manage this differently. Uh, so I, I can't sit here and tell you that everybody does it the same, but what I will do is say everybody has to pay the same, uh, depending on what type of environment they're in. They're in an open shop or a union shop um, and prevailing wage. So how you manage that and how you want to uh, recap, recapitulate that cost or capture that cost and recognize it is kind of up to you. From a general contractor standpoint, we take, uh, and this is tied directly to productivity um, of the direct wage. So let's just say a carpenter is making $45 an hour, okay? And then the labor burden cost or the fringe components or the FICA food and SUDA components that that individual and the company pay to the state and the feds. And then uh, in our world, we pay also a component uh, of uh, union fringe benefits to that uh, that goes into the health and welfare fund for that individual based on all the hours that uh, they work. Okay, so from an estimate standpoint, when you're estimating say productivity for form work for concrete forms or anything, uh, framing, wood framing or steel framing, uh, what you wanna do is you wanna understand what your true productivity is for any element of work. So we, we separate out the fringe benefits, so to speak, or the labor burden. Uh, we segregate that from the bare wage component, the $45 an hour that the individual's gonna make. And we calculate the labor burden, which are the fringe benefits and the union benefits. And the, and the bottom line in what we call the um, markup section, so in the direct cost of the work, in the uh, estimate uh, above, all the concrete labor, all the framing labor and all the other miscellaneous labor, not the general conditions labor, but all the other um, direct labor is a direct cost of the hour, or is a direct reflection of the hourly wage. There are some companies that will ignore that and say, we got to pay it anyway. So what difference does it make? So if the, if, uh, the direct wage is $45 an hour and our component percentage markup for labor burden, which is the uh, FICA food and SUDA and the, and the union wage benefits is 45 or 50%. It can be even higher in certain craft trades, uh, iron workers and pipe fitters and the likes make higher um, uh, union health and welfare benefits um, than uh, say carpenters and laborers do. It could be up as high as 75% for certain craft trades. What they'll do is they'll add that all into um, the, the wage and then we'll use that wage, that number to base the productivity on uh, for any given element of work. Not trying to set, make it sound confusing to you. And like I said, you got two ways to be able to manage that, whatever's easiest for you. Um, it actually just works out 
at the end, as long as you have it all included in the estimate, it works out to probably one less uh, step in terms of the mathematics or the arithmetic of totaling up your estimate. Okay, in, in my world, we separate out the fringe benefits and the labor burden separate from um, the direct cost of the labor. Okay, so uh, I, I don't want to really belabor that much longer, like I said, no pun intended, but that's how you have to look at labor versus the other direct cost components in the job, material and subcontractor costs. Okay. Um, hey, Tom, do you wanna go over those poll results real quick? Yeah. Okay, let's look at uh, them. We'll, we'll go through questions um, two, three and four. So here's question two. Okay, question two was, which of the following is not a general conditions cost? Um, it's answer, it's uh, answer B, placing concrete. That's a direct cost. It's not in the general conditions. Uh, remember what I said, the general conditions uh, is a cost component of the project that is an indirect cost because it's associated with managing the work. It's not labor that's incorporated into the project uh, structure, the permanent structure of the project. Okay. okay. Um, question number three. Um, what costs are bid markup costs? Um, the correct answer is A, B, and D. Uh, Concrete pumping costs are not uh, markups because they're a subcontractor on the project that is pumping the concrete material through their equipment. And therefore that's a direct cost because it's uh, in, in, uh, contributing towards being directly integrated into the cost of the project. Awesome. The when I say the project, I mean the structure, okay? Whatever it happens to be, whether it's a building foundation or a highway or anything, concrete pumping is a direct cost. Gotcha. Okay, question number four. Which costs are direct costs? The correct answer is A, B, C, and D. Okay. Uh, Line item E is a bond and insurance cost. That is an indirect cost. Again, it goes back to what are the costs that are incorporated directly into the structure? Labor costs, um, material costs, task specific equipment, and supply bids. I can talk a little bit about this one. The, none of these questions are, first of all, none of these questions are meant to be trick questions, but. <laughs> Um, I, I don't believe in trick questions. I believe in enabling people's understanding of uh, the subject matter and not trying to confuse them. Uh, but I still want to get them to think about um, the topical matter, whatever the, the topic is at that point, but to clear, have a clear understanding of uh, what um, the, the, the uh, outcome is of whatever it is subject that you're talking about in this case direct cost. As I said, labor, uh, arguably somebody could sit back there and say, well, you say labor, but you don't just differentiate between direct labor, craft trade labor, the carpenters and laborers that are working on the project or for general conditions labor versus um, project manager and superintendent that are working in the job trailer managing the job. That's a good point. Uh, and maybe what I should have said uh, there was uh, craft trade labor, okay? But um, the way it was uh, illustrated on uh, my slide is how it's illustrated here in this question. Okay, so- um, hey, Tom, just is still online. She's still online. Tanaka, are you still with us? Tanaka's with the Port of Seattle. I am. Oh, I wanted you to be able to say hello to everybody on our second session. <laughs> Hi, good afternoon, everybody. I'm sorry I was late uh, attending. I had to 
I put some fires out today. Um, but definitely, Tom, all the information uh, you've talked about so far has been um, extremely on point and uh, definitely uh, seems like everybody was interested and has a lot of questions. Um, I agree, uh, bidding and estimating always takes a lot more time than we uh, can imagine, but it's definitely critical. Um, so again, thank you again for all the participants. Thank you again for PTAC, uh, Lily, Tanya, Jessica, and Tom, thank you again for your presentation. And I look forward to uh, coming, you coming back um, and continuing giving uh, not only the participants, but also um, Lily, Tanya, myself, and um, even Daryl some information that we may either have forgotten or just uh, don't really realize a lot of times um, in our day-to-day -day work dealing with construction. Um, and thank you, um, I appreciate everyone. And if you have any questions regarding um, specific bids or projects at the Port of Seattle, you definitely can reach out to not only myself or our team, Diversity and Contracting. Um, Lily has all of our contact information. And again, I'll put my information in the chat. So uh, thank you, Tanya, for this time and speaking. This is a good point that we do stop at because the second half is gonna be totally focused on the estimate structure. Yeah. And mm -hmm. right now for everybody that's on uh, this seminar is uh, Lily and Tanya have the PDFs of all those documents that they're going to see in the second um, presentation regarding estimate structures. So send Tanya or, or uh, Lily an email and they will, or, or they'll post it up on a Dropbox or something. And you can get to take a look at that um, before we uh, start back up on this thing. And then uh, the, one, the one last thing I want to get in that they asked me to talk about was um, some of our upcoming bit. Do you still have a screen share on here? Uh -huh. can yes. See, can they see my screen? Yep. Okay. These are some of our upcoming bid opportunities. They asked me to put those up there. And these are uh, the five projects that we have in pre-construction services right now. The, the first one coming up is Ferndale High School up in Whatcom County, uh, north of Bellingham. That's a $100 million project. Um, and then the next one that's coming up for sub bids will be Discovery Elementary School in Muckleteo. That'll be uh, mid, early mid year. We'll probably go out for uh, bids on that in uh, April and May. And then you can see some of the other ones. We got a couple Seattle School District ones there and then a uh, Renton one. And then the other thing, and we can talk about those later, but the other thing I wanted to get up there was I wanted to mention Vicki uh, our um, uh, diversity, equity, and inclusiveness manager, uh, Vicki Puckett. And if you guys have any questions at all or want to get in contact with us here at uh, Cornerstone to further learn how to do business with us, uh, give Vicki a call or email. And Vicki and I work together. We have an office also down in the Tabor 100 building in uh, Tukwila. And we sp Vicki spends two days a week down there and I go down there um, every other week or so to, to work with her on this thing, but uh, we'd be happy to meet with you either virtually like we're doing today or uh, when the appropriate time comes that we can get back face to face, either here in our office in Bothell or down at the Tabor building in uh, Tukwila. So get a hold of Vicki and she'll channel you to the right person, especially for some of these bid opportunities that we have coming up. Okay. Thank you so much. Great presentation, Tom. And I know it's, it is a lot of information. So everybody heard how they can get, um, you know, get more information about working with Cornerstone is with Vicki Puckett. Yeah, um, Vicki will help you out there. Yeah, so I know last week we talked about this and I know it's not the most comfortable feeling to, you know, FaceTime with somebody or to Zoom and your picture is out there. But what you do is you just get started slowly. Just start doing it. You know, leave your photos up there or leave your camera on. And then, you know, you can go in and out. You can, you can turn it off if you're doing something. And, but you've got to get used to it because eventually, you know, we might, that's the way we might have to meet. And really it's efficient to meet this way because you're not driving from your office, driving somewhere, yeah, taking up your time. Zoom meetings are very effective. I mean, it was a little rocky back earlier in the year 
uh, trying to get you know up to speed on this thing. But we've had six months of experience at doing this now. And and um, I I was just commenting to Dave, our president, earlier be today before we started this, how uh, much more efficient that Zoom meetings can actually be in terms of productivity and tr uh, trade and information and ideas. It's it's always nice to have a face to face meeting and to be able to do the networking and stuff, but um, you know, the, the Zoom process is pretty efficient. All right, well, thank you so much, Tom, for your time. And then we'll go ahead and get that rescheduled and we'll let everybody know when that yeah, reschedule Yeah, just happens. let me know that- um, The second half. What, what date you wanna do it on. Uh, it'll probably Lily? be a, an equivalent amount of time. Okay, Lily, you wanna go ahead and close us out with your words of wisdom? <laughs> words of wisdom. <laughs> Please contact us, work with us. Um, this is not just a workshop. I said that to Tanya, we, we're not doing any just workshop. No, we are going to be here for you guys. Hold your hands and you know, we have the support, support service. Use us and um, email us and let's work together. We want you to get the projects. I mean, you know, you get the project, you get awarded, you know, you are successful. We take credit for it. <laughs> How cool is that, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> You're with us. You're successful. We're su we, we, we take credit. That's all. We, so, we'll to, we would like to talk to you guys about helping out with your bonding also. Um, you know, you got Don, you got a lot of resources here. Like I said, we're not the only general contractor that's interested in enabling you guys to, um, you know, get that bonding capacity you need to support your company growth. So, don't, don't hesitate to talk to us about that. Yeah, we provide, remember, we provide bookkeeping service, we provide CPA, we provide everything, but you need to do the work. Get rid, you know, get the application, start working on the application. It's not gonna be easy, but we're here for you guys, that's all. And thank you, Port of Seattle, for supporting us. So. Um, thank you, this is Victor Mitchell. You all come. Uh -huh. Go ahead. Victor, you wanna say something? I, I'm just saying, um, Tom, I, I know him. Big, this, um, uh, this is Victor Mitchell. Yeah, I'm just talking about Anybody else? One last thing, go Seahawks. 